Hello, everyone. Andy Jacob here with the dot-com magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. What a fascinating show today. You know, I've been waiting to get Dr. Jamie Valenzuela Mumau on the show for a number of weeks. He's a leader in the education space. And, you know, so many people reach out to me at the dot-com magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series, and they say, Jake, we love it when you bring leaders in their particular space on the field. So, of course, we're always going through our Rolodex. And, and when Jamie uh, came across my desk, I looked up what he was doing. Of course, my team said, hey, this, this gentleman is really making a large impact in the educational system throughout the United States. And we need to get him on the show. So I reached out to Jamie and I'm just so thankful that he was able to come on the show and agreed to come on to talk about what he's doing at Coherent Educational Solutions. I mean, this is phenomenal, but without further ado, Jamie, welcome to the Dotcom Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. Thank you so much. It's really good to be here. Yeah, this is super great. And what you're doing is really incredible. You're really putting together what I would call just a systemic change in the educational system for marginalized students. It's so remarkable. But before I co come in with all my questions, let's pull the lens back to 30,000 feet, like we always do, like we're known for, and tell us about what you're doing at Coherent Educational Solutions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, our goal and our mission is to support systemic educational change within the K-12 environment for historically marginalized youth and their families. We believe very strongly that youth, when they leave the K-12 system, should have had opportunities for agency. They should be uh, self-determined. They should also have opportunities for critical thinking, self-regulation, and then also have that efficacy that's necessary in order for them to meet the demands of what the 2025 and 2030, 2035 job skill sets are uh, as, as written by the economic, uh, World Economic Forum. So that's really our mission is to provide those students the same access that other students have uh, across the nation, regardless of address. It's so interesting. Let's break it down a little bit. You know, when we look at the, what's going on with what we call marginalized students, why are they marginalized? What, what can we do to sort of get them uh, to become part of a different kind of a narrative? Yeah, I that's a really good question. And I think the steps happen to be on the social emotional side more so than the academic side. And so uh, COVID was actually uh, an experience that brought educators to understand the necess necessity of marrying SEL, social emotional learning with academics. And so what we truly believe is that if there are three criteria and three psychological needs met within these learners, then they too will have that intrinsic motivation activated so that they become part of the learning process instead of learning happening to them. And that's the way that it's been for so many years that, that we haven't, we really haven't brought them with us, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. And, and what happens? What happens to society at large as these marginalized students now with your leadership and what you're doing at your company at Coherent start becoming part of the conversation, start becoming part of society? What happens to society at large? Well, I think we're going to see a distinct change uh, in the coming years of our global competition within the economy, uh, the world economy. I think that we're going to have uh, black and brown kids be able to stand up with efficacy and say, I know where I'm going, regardless of what they're up, you know, what situation they find themselves in as their children growing up. They will have the idea of how to work well with people. So they're going to exit our systems to be able to go right into career and or college to then bring creative solutions to problems that we don't even know exist yet. Yeah, that's powerful. And what a great way to contribute to society. Who reaches out to Coherent Educational Solutions? What type of people or industries or, or educational groups reach out to you for your help? So uh, obviously the K-12 uh, system leaders and you know principals and superintendents, boards of the like, especially now that they have a windfall of money that's come from the federal and state governments to support their efforts. 
Also, you might be surprised to know that we have uh, private industry also reach out to us because, quite frankly, it's those same three psychological needs that need to be met within any system in order for intrinsic motivation to be activated. And so when any system wants to improve the motivation of their employees or, or their, their circle, then we can provide that service and we have provided that service. And it's, it's really exciting to see how it affects even industry outside of education. Wow, that's so interesting. So it can affect industries outside of education as well. You know, you mentioned motivation. So let's talk about a little bit. Let's say we have some students and they just can't get themselves motivated. You know, they just, they, they go to school, they kind of, they kind of go through it, but they're not really passionate. They haven't found anything that really kicks in in their mind or their spirit or their soul or their body. And they just like go to go through the motions. How do we get these students to, to sort of start thinking passionately about becoming a better student and a better member of society? Absolutely. And I believe that students come to the table that way because environments in the past, in their experience, haven't been set like we would describe for them to be set. So for example, those three psychological needs that I'm talking about is that learners have to have agency and autonomy. That's number one. They need to feel that. Number two, it's the it's the, 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 the facilitator or teacher's responsibility to set an environment of belonging. So they have to feel belonged, if you will, within their class setting. And then thirdly, there has to be competency building. And so the teacher has to set an environment that, that has tools to help build that competence. So when those three psychological needs are met, the activation of intrinsic motivation happens and then students start realizing that success. And then all of a sudden, wow, here we are, they're engaged and not just reliant upon external motivation factors to get involved. Yeah, that's super cool. And let's talk about teachers because in my mind, you know, the teachers are the unsung heroes. You know, they go to work every day. They're passionate about their kids and and sometimes it seems like they don't get the support that really they need to continue to be like the positive, powerful, impactful, impactful people that they, that they really are. So how do we make sure our teachers get that same type of support that, you know, you're able to give to the, to the students at this point in time? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I have to first say, uh, I am super grateful for every single teacher uh, in this country and in this world who has really fought through the last uh, 24 months. It has been a challenge and their resilience is just amazing. I think at the end of the day, we have to, uh, the way in which we can support teachers is to really change the way in which we provide assessment for how kids are performing. Because Teachers have the notion of kids being able to be assessed based on their competence rather than sitting down at one test one day, one time, which then may or may not be the right day or right time for kids to show knowledge and competency around per particular things. We want to look at students who are uh, able to be problem solvers. And so the way to support teachers is creating a work environment that allows for that to happen because that's where the natural teacher goes in the lesson planning design process. Yeah, that's so interesting. You know, let's say a school district reaches out to you and they start the conversation. They've heard about, you know, your reputation. They've heard about what your company's doing. Maybe they were on an, in an online Zoom call or at a conference and everybody's talking about, you know, Jamie, what your company's doing. What does that first conversation sound like with the school district superintendent or whoever's calling to reach out to you? Yeah, I think uh, the first conversation is tell me about where you believe you are. Uh, and and it's a listening tour. It's a listening tour of not only the lead instructional leader who is the superintendent of schools, but then other folks within the system so that a holistic picture can be given. Many times, as you might guess, a superintendent sits at a district office and they think things are really going in the direction that they've planned. Yet when you get to the boots on the ground, we're not making as much progress as we would had hoped for various reasons and circumstances at different sites. So it really truly is a listening tour to understand context and culture and then uh, goals. What do they want for kids? 
And so in order for them to engage in a process like we're talking about, they have to truly uh, agree that kids should own the learning and teachers should own the teaching. And if we can get that agreement, then we actually put kids in charge of their own learning, if that makes any sense, facilitated by an instructor where they can actually become part of the process instead of the process being done to them, which we've done for so many years. Yeah, that's amazing, Jamie. You know, when I think about it, you know, it's been a long time since I've been in school. You know, I don't want to even say how many years, uh, but I think about the kids today, right? And they've got this social networking and they've got all the, you know, the Twitter and the Facebook and the Instagram and the TikTok and everything else. I'm saying to myself, how does a young kid, how does a child even focus in at school when all this other stuff outside is sort of happening to them, because, you know, we know the social networks do stuff to the kids. How does all that sort of, you know, how do you think about that as a leader in the field, Jamie? I'm very curious about that. Yeah, that's a really good question. And and what I would say to that is uh, for lack of engagement in school around items that link to life, where kids see value, they're going to hit the social media. They're going to hit those other areas and rely upon that as they're learning. So I have a vision that one day school is going to be so much different. And here's what I mean by that. Imagine if you come to school and you don't have your 45 minutes of math and your 45 minutes of English, and then you pull down the SEL document that says, oh, it's time to do social emotional learning at 10 a.m. in the morning. And that's the only time we can do it. You know how it's all integrated once we leave high school, right? So imagine if you came to school and you were faced with your team every day with a problem that's appropriate for your learning level, that's societal, that's school, that's whatever that problem may be and from wherever it comes, then you apply your language, arts, your math, your social science, and your sciences to that problem and work through and show competence on how you've worked through that problem. I imagine if you've ever been to STEAM camp that I want a school system that is just like STEAM camp every single day where kids actually are engaging. My case in point, there's a school in Illinois where kids showed interest in 3D printing. Would you believe that they printed appendages and used rubber bands for those appendages that became working appendages for children in Africa who were in need and didn't have access? That's the kind of schooling system that I think we need to go towards because that's real life. And if you look at the World Economic Forum, they have these discrete skills that kids need to have. And we're tying what we're doing to those skills that are coming in the future. And guess what? It's not graphing a parabola. I'm a former math teacher, so I feel like I can say that because the last time I graphed is when I taught it. Maybe the last time you graphed it was when you were in high school. So the point is, Let's look at what we're teaching our children. Let's aim for where the World Economic Forum says the skill sets are needed. And let's marry those two together through a process that honors our kids. That's what we bring to the table. Yeah, that's going to be a powerful future that, of course, you envision as someone that I call a zeitgeist and a futurist, someone that understands what needs to happen. Now, I want to bring a little light into the world because we've heard so so many stories that are sort of the dark stories about suicide and kids, you know, children's suicide and youth suicide and, you know, the emotional challenges that these kids, some some of these kids are having right now. You know, we just had a recent uh, story about a big challenge in Michigan. But when you look at it as a leader, Jamie, you know, what do we do about this? What, how do we get to the kids, not only the marginalized kids, but all the kids to have them have a little bit better, maybe self-confidence and and uh, self-feeling about themselves so that we we don't keep this uh, epidemic going of people hurting themselves? Yeah, absolutely. Very, very good question. Um, I think uh, prevention is is obviously something that that the staff need to be aware of, and we need to train in prevention. And we have a, a leg of our business that absolutely does that work. But to your question, I believe, and, and the research is clear, that when kids feel that they belong, 
when kids understand and honor their own dignity and the di dignity of others and the funds of knowledge and experience that they come to the table with within a system, you're going to see a, a stark reduction in a lot of these feelings because then what happens is efficacy builds. And when efficacy builds, you feel, I mean, you stand taller. And so you believe that you can do it at the end of the day, using Carol Dweck's growth mindset and instilling that within the students is exactly where we need to go. So that's what I'm grateful for our industry for now after COVID or nearing the end of COVID, we hope, is that we're recognizing the importance of the SEL piece as well as the academic piece and so my colleague, Dr. Dion Claybaugh and I, we've published a framework that marries those two together with those SEL outcomes equally as important as the academic outcomes. And that's the basis of our work. Well, wow, Jamie, that's awesome. Now, for the next question, I'm going to call you Dr. Valenzuela Muma, because oh. uh, I want to know about, and uh, some of our uh, people watching the show, they, they reached out to me and and they said, listen, when you get someone that's an ed education expert on, ask them this question. So this really comes from the audience. What's the relationship between what's happening in the schools and what's happening at home? And they want to know sort of if there's a, a home life that's not really as strong as you'd like to see it, what chance does that child have to really, you know, perform in an amazing way? What's the relationship between home and school? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and what I would say to that is that there is importance between the relationship of home and school. And educators, um, we, we need to take a, a, a larger picture of how we engage with our parent uh, and uh, 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 guardian community to ensure that the, the whole child's needs are being met. Um, you ask, you, the way in which you ask the question is also very interesting because what my initial response is, is that the home environment does play a factor, but if educators were really working with kids to build them with, uh, with, with the skills that we're discussing, then they take the choice of how to mitigate the home environment versus the school environment. I think the other piece is I, schools absolutely should be centric to all of the social services that are available. And we should be the ones to be connecting parents to particular services that are provided by city, state and fed so that their needs can be met. It goes back to Maslow's at the end of the day. It's the same thing. If kids' needs aren't met, they're not going to learn. If the family's needs aren't met, they're not going to be as supportive for the child to grow within the system. <clears throat> but I, I, I think that uh, the relationship has to, has to be strong in some sense uh, on, on, a, on a scale uh, from the school to the home. And we have to honor the home. Too often we hear educators say, well, it's the home. Well, guess what? It's all of us at the end of the day. And so what specific steps are we going to take to help that child realize their full potential? Yeah, that's awesome. That makes all the sense in the world. It's a balance, of course. And, and right. uh, one side can empower the other side in a very powerful way. And the educators can empower the children, which then brings light into the family. So that makes all the sense in the world. Now, Jamie, I wanted to give you a chance because I thought it would be very interesting to sort of talk directly to sort of the administrators, the people that are sort of running the schools. And, you know, they, they've got a lot on their plate right now. There's a lot going on and sort of give you an opportunity to sort of reach out to them through this interview and, and talk to them in a way that might be meaningful to them regarding why it's important to bring somebody in for maybe from the outside to take a look and help them to get from point A to B in a meaningful way to empower their, their district, empower their schools, empower their students. Thank you for that. Uh, I would say uh, talking with administrators and school leaders, the number one priority that we all share is the continued success of kids in the transfer from school to community. And we're responsible deeply responsible for that transfer. 
whether kids are career prepared while they're with us or whether they're college prepared, our job is to support that child and that family to realize those goals. The way in which to support has to be reliant upon what our beliefs are about that every child can be successful and reach their full potential. And so I would throw a calling out to my colleagues to say, in what ways are you supporting educators, the frontline staff, to develop the skills and tools necessary that build up rather than tear down, that support kids to reach the goal that they have and not the goal that I have? And how do we balance that within an awkward assessment that the federal government is demanding of our states? And so as we're looking to hopefully get that switched from one day, one test, one time to competency over time, what ways are you going to stand up for the social justice issue that is so very clear for all kids? It's so powerful. I mean, it's so great. I can't wait to have you back on the show. We're going to invite you back because I want to unravel and I want to uncover sort of this futuristic look that you have and get into that a little bit deeper because that's so powerful when you think about it and some of the examples that you gave about you know, the, 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 the classroom that did some 3D printing and they started creating something to, to help the world. And, you know, when you hit on something like that, it just gets me thinking about so many additional questions and, and only someone like you that would have those types of answers about what the future looks like. And from my perspective with leaders like you, Jamie, the future looks very bright. And this has been a great, great interview I love what you're doing at Coherent Educational Solutions. It's a leader, it's a leadership position. And, and I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on the dot com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series. We're going to have you back again, but for now, this has been amazing. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes.